mentioned who Schrodinger was and that he comes up with this mathematical derivation and he figures out the probability of every single electron being in a particular position outside the nucleus, which is craziness, okay? Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that your electron, it, the number of electrons, it depends on what atom you're talking about. You can see, for example, that hydrogen only has one proton. So if it's neutral, then how many electrons does it have? One. 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 But if it loses its electron, just its one electron, it has zero. And all that you have is a positively charged <coughs> uh, one proton. One or two, you can have two neutrons with it as well. But with no electrons, none of Schrodinger's <coughs> stuff even applies because there are no electrons, so there's nothing going around your nucleus. It's just the nucleus and that's it. But you can have something like gold. Gold has 79 protons, so if it's neutral, how many electrons does it have? 79. 79. And so what Schrodinger did was he basically figures out where are all of these electrons. But we don't really know where they are. It's just based on probability. But he calculates where is the, where is the highest probability of locating the electron outside the nucleus. And he comes up with, just like in a dress. So for example, let's say that I wanted to know where you were um, with it, just in the, in the world, okay? Where were you, all right? And we found out, first of all, we said that N referred to what high school you went to, okay? So we would say West Bloomfield High School. Now within West Bloomfield High School, what block are you in? Are you in the science block? Are you in the math block? So now here we're at about, how many people go to this school? About 2,000, right? So here we're, you're one of 2,000. So now we're going to come in and say, okay, what block are you in? Are you in the science block, the math block, the English block? Um, the, the global language block, where are you? And so this kind of brings it down to maybe about 300 people, depending on how many students are in that block. Now we're gonna bring it down to what classroom you're in. So now we're gonna say, you're in room 507. And in room 507, there could be about 35 people in this room, okay? So we would say you're one of 35. And then we're gonna bring it down one more to say what desk are you sitting in? And the idea that Sch what Schrodinger did was, he first talked about, and I'm gonna explain, we're gonna go through all of these. He first talks about what energy level is the electron in? Is it just outside of the nucleus? Or is it seven levels outside of the nucleus? Second thing he looks at is called the sublevel or the shape. And within each energy level, there are different shapes and they call them sublevels. It's like rows in a theater or sections in a theater. And so within those, what shape, within those energy levels, what shape is the electron in? Then we look at, there are things called orbitals, and each orbital is like a cloud. It's like a cloud shape. And within each cloud, you can actually have two electrons. And then we're gonna get down to which direction is your electron spinning? So of those two electrons, which one are we talking about? We're actually gonna start here in the notes because this is the easiest one, and then we'll bounce back and talk about energy levels, talk about the shapes, and then talk about this what are orbitals. But we're gonna actually start with the spin. And the spin is the easiest one of all of those, okay? And what it basically tells us is it gets us down to energy level, sublevel, which orbital, then which spin does your electron have in order to be able to pinpoint where the electron is with highest probability, with the greatest amount of probability, away from the nucleus, okay? And that's that's what Schrodinger basically did for us. And he, his, um, the way that he did it, first of all, even though these are called quantum numbers, what are you noticing? They're not numbers, they're letters. letters. Okay, but what he, the reason why he calls them quantum numbers is because he uses numbers to describe each one, and so we're gonna talk about that today as well, okay? So let's start off with um, what the quantum numbers are. So this is called, this is N, and it's called the principal quantum number. This is L, it's called the azimuthal quantum number. This is actually supposed to be M subscript L. So if you write it as M subscript L, that's basically how it should be written. And then this one is M subscript S, MS. And the M stands for magnetic, so that's the magnetic quantum number. So why do you think this one says MS? What do you think the S is for? Spin, perfect, it's the magnetic spin quantum number. So they're pretty easy to, um, to remember. So let's talk about the spin. And um, 
So in every single cloud, let's talk about this cloud for just a minute. They're called orbitals. They're not orbits, they're orbitals, okay? So if you imagine having a cloud, and what are our clouds made of? What do you know they're made of? What's water in the cloud? Vapor. Water, right? It's just water. Is there a hard, solid line? So those of you that have ever flown through the clouds, is there a hard, solid line where all of a sudden, if you were able to reach out, reach your hand out, um, out to the clouds when you were on a plane, would there be something that would be solid that would hit into your hand? No. Yes or no? no? No. There is no solid line. And are the water molecules confined to the inside of your cloud shape? No. Are the water molecules confined to it? No. no. You can actually have water molecules that are outside of it, okay? But what happens is they accumulate, and so then you can get different types of clouds, right? So you can have those cumulonimbus clouds or a whole bunch of different types of clouds. But the thing is, those water molecules can be outside. They don't have to be all the way inside, okay? And it's not something that's hard and solid. And same thing with this. What happens is these cloud shapes are simply where the electron may be, where it may be. Not where it is, not where it definitely is, it's where it may be with the highest probability. And so he draws dots and the where it's darker, where it looks more dense, is where there's a higher probability and that's all it is. So within these orbitals or these cloud shapes, he says that you can fit two electrons. What's wrong with having two electrons in the same space? They're, they're, uh, they what? They repel. repel. Why do they repel? They're, they're both, both negative. negative. And you, we know that opposites attract, but two like charges will repel. Yes? Yeah. So the question was, how was it that you could have two electrons in one orbital? So there actually, there's a different scientist that did, that did this, but his name was Pauli. And we'll talk about him. He's one of the, it's one of the vocab words, um, actually, Pauli's exclusion principle. So what they ended up saying, what the scientists at the time ended up figuring out was, if one of them was spinning in one direction, I want everybody to try this, and the other one was spinning in the opposite direction. Those of you that are musicians will probably have an easier time with this. What I want you to do, it's, it's harder for people that don't play music, here's why. People that play music, a lot of times, if your right hand, so I've been playing the piano lately, your right hand is doing something, your left hand may be doing something different, and so we, we may be, it may have an easier time doing that, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to spin in one direction, let go. Close your eyes if you want. I want you to let go. Okay, let go of that. Just let your hand keep moving. Now I want you to add your left hand in and see if you can just spin your left hand in the opposite direction. Okay? If you're a musician, you'll probably get it more quickly if you've never done it before. All right? Then you can try to, to move your leg at the same time and see if that works. So <laughs> I, um, I think I was telling you that I play the organ. And uh, I, I just started, I don't know how to play the organ. I play the piano on the organ. The organ, has anybody ever played an organ before? Okay, what do you know is on the ground? The pedals. There is not just the pedal. There is an entire keyboard on the ground, okay? So I don't play, I don't know how to do that. I just, I do the pedals because the pedals can do how loud and how you can change that. So I can use the pedals, but I don't know how to, how to hit the notes. Like you can literally hit notes and play at the same time. It's, it's craziness, okay? Um, so I, 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 I don't do that. I don't know how to do that. I haven't practiced enough. I started trying, okay? So... Um, so what happens is, if the electrons are moving in opposite directions, what do you think happens to the fields? They, I don't know. What do you think can happen to them? They what? They, well, it works in the opposite direction. You can actually cancel the fields out. So instead of them repelling, now they can be together within one confined area. Because otherwise, it doesn't make sense that they would be together, okay? So this spin, all it is, it's this magnetic spin quantum number, it's the spin of the electron. It can either be positive plus one half or minus one half is what we're gonna call this. Just get rid of this. All right, so it's, yep, I have this on here. So your spin is either a minus one half or a plus one half. It doesn't matter what direction. We're gonna say arbitrary a bunch of times. Arbitrary, what that is, is you know how we always call this the x-axis on a graph and we call this the y. y, okay? It's arbitrary. You can call it A and you can call it B. You can call it X and you can call it Y. It doesn't really matter, right? It's just a variable. So it's arbitrary which one you call plus one half and which one you call minus one half as long as you know that they both have to have opposite spins, okay? 
And so that's all that, it, that, that this is. So in orange on mine, I don't care what color you're using on yours, it's either positive or negative, and each orbital um, can have two electrons spinning opposite, and now the numbers I'm gonna do in a different color. So I already used pink, green, and yellow, I'm just gonna use red. And so my spin can either be a minus one half or a plus one half, those are my two. Right here in orange, I just want you to rewrite this. So in any one orbital, in any one orbital, you can have two electrons max, okay? In any one orbital, you can have two maximum number of electrons. You don't have to have any electrons. You can have zero. You can only have one. It's possible to just have one, but two max. One plus one half, one spinning the opposite is minus one half, okay? Good with spin? So that's the, that's the whole idea of spin. Let's come back and let's talk about this N, this energy level. So this is called the principal quantum number. It stands for, everybody say N for energy level. N for energy level. It's not nanometers, because or nano anything, nanograms or nanoseconds, because that would have N something else after it, okay? So this is N for energy level. All this is, is Schrodinger wanted to give a quantum number that describes how far away is your electron from the nucleus. And it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The only thing is, as you get further and further from the nucleus, just like we talked about with Bohr's model, it's like you getting to the top of the escalator. You know how the steps get closer and closer together? As you get to the top, those energy levels are actually closer to each other. That's the only thing. Question. For different atoms, are the energy levels the same distance from the nucleus or different? It depends on how many electrons they have. That's a great question. So that's all it depends on. Like hydrogen, if hydrogen only has one, then the electrons are going to be right outside the nucleus. So if there are 79 electrons like gold would have, then they're going, to, they're going to be further out from the nucleus, and you'll have those energy levels filled. Great question. Okay. And um, we're going to talk, when we do, the, um, one of the units that we'll do later is called periodic trends, and we'll talk about the size and the radii of the atoms. They can have the same number of energy levels, but some of them can be smaller and some of them can be bigger. So great question. Okay. So here are levels, and it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It could keep on going, but based on the periodic table that we have today, it goes up to seven. Okay, so um, in theory, it could go further, but this is all that we have so far. All right, so now let's talk about this L. All right, it's a lowercase cursive L, and it's called the azimuthal quantum number. And this tells us the energy level, but the L tells us the shape or the sublevel. Okay. So um, it says it's the shape where it's most probable to find the electron. And L has four different numbers that are associated with it. Zero, one, two, and three. And the letters that Schrodinger matches up are S, P, D, and F. They're all lowercase. S, P, D, and F. Okay, I want you to write this. I know it sounds inappropriate. We're going to do this together. Next to the S, I want you to write six. Next to the P, I want you to write P. Next to the D, I want you to write dump. And next to the F, I want you to write flush. Oh. Yeah, Phil, what? What are we doing here? Okay, we're going to do this together. I will turn off the light so that you're more comfortable, okay? But here's what's going to happen. We are going to... First, everyone's going to stand. Okay, I'll stand up here so that you'll be able to see me once you're standing. And we're going to say, zero, sit. Zero, sit. And then we're going to sit. Then we're going to say, one, pee. Then we're going to say, two, dump. You've got to use your low voice. Your lowest voice. Two, dump. And then you're going to go, three. And you're going to go, three, flush. Okay? So everybody do this with me. Everybody stand now. Explain it after. Okay? Everybody stand up. I'll turn off the lights for you. I'll turn off the lights. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Ready? Everybody stand up. You're going to do this with me? No, no, you don't, no, you don't have to get up on your desk. Okay, ready? Here we go. You're going to see this with me. It's going to go zero sit. Everybody say it. Zero sit. Go sit. One P. Say it. One P. Okay, now two and then a low voice dog. Two, do. And. Three, flush. Everybody stand up. It's your exercise for the day, too. Everybody stand up. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Zero, sit. 
One, E, two, do, three, flush. Last time, stand. Faster this time, ready? Here we go. Zero, sit. One, P, two, do, three, flush. Awesome. Let's turn the lights back. Okay. No, that's not part of that's not part of Schrodinger's thing. Okay, but this is I, I try to have ways of remembering things, and so the cool thing about this is because you might be thinking like, couldn't she have come up with other things that started with an S, a P, a D, and an F? But watch because it gets better. Okay, if you if you had to go P, but you wanted to use a number, and you were like, hey, I gotta go, I gotta go P, but you were like. Gotta go, gotta go. What number would you use if you had to go and you wanted to give them a number? Everybody say it. One. Okay, if you had to take a dump, you're like, oh no, gotta take a dump, gotta take a dump. You would say I have to go? Number two. Awesome, okay. Now, there isn't a sit, so then I added the sit. That's just gonna be your zero. So you would first sit, then you would go number one, that's P, you would go number two, that's dump, and then don't forget to flush like my kids do. Okay, so that's gonna be your three, it's gonna be your flush, all right? Um, so you need to be able to relate the letter, the numbers to the letters, okay? You need to be able to relate the numbers to the letters. So zero is a sit, what's one? P, what's two? Dumb. And what's F? F. Flush. Or what's three? three? F. Flush. F. F. Flush. Okay. So as long as you can remember what letter goes with what number, then that will um, that's going to help you a lot with this. So these are the shapes, though, and we haven't said anything about the shapes. I gave you some letters, but I'm going to tell you first that he was Austrian, so this isn't he. These aren't done in English, okay? But the S still works. The S is a sphere shape. So this shape right here is sphere. So that's what the S is, it's sphere, okay? The P, we're gonna say peanut, but it's actually not called a peanut. If you look up here, it's called a dumbbell, okay? So in the books, they don't call it a peanut, but we're gonna say peanut, that way you remember P for peanut, okay? If you watch videos, if you, watch, if you do something in the books, they're not gonna say peanut, they're gonna say dumbbell, okay? This next one is actually called clover, but we're going to call it daisy instead, and that way it starts with a D, okay? So instead of calling it clover, I will still refer to it as clover, but just so that you can remember it, you can think of that as daisy. And then the Fs aren't shown on here, okay? So these are the four shapes. There's sphere, there's, there's peanut, um, or the dumbbell, there's the clover, and then the F are really complex. I will show you how those are drawn. I'll show you um, a picture uh, from the internet. Um, on that as well. Okay, so what is this? This is the shape where the electron should most probably be based on Schrodinger's calculations. But if I were to say at 1230 or whatever time, I'm looking for Sam. And let's say that Sam sits right in the middle of the room in the fourth desk, middle row, fourth desk, okay? And so then um, I say, okay, Sam is in West Bluefield High School. And then the next thing that we said was, what block? So Sam should be in the science block. The next thing was, which classroom? Room 507. And then the next thing was, what desk? And so then we would say it would be the third row and the fourth desk. Now, what are the chances, chances that Sam is there? Well, it depends on the time, right? Because if you came at 1.30, or maybe if you came at 3.30, would Sam be sitting in that desk? No. Probably not, okay? And maybe Sam's not in that desk because Sam is at a lab table, all right? Same thing with the electrons. The electrons, it is possible that they're not where they're supposed to be, but this is where the calculation is with highest probability. So that's what these cloud shapes are. And where it's darker, so like right in here, where it looks like it's darker, that's where the probability is the highest outside the nucleus. So you'd have the nucleus right in the middle, but don't forget, the, uh, the atom is mostly what? Empty, Empty space. space. So you have your nucleus, and then the nucleus, remember, was like the size of a marble compared to a football stadium, okay? But those electrons, it's mostly empty space in between those electrons, so just keeping that in mind as well. So in this um, peanut shape, or the dumbbell shape, you will have electrons, uh, the electrons, and you can have two maximum in each one of these, that will have the highest probability of being located there. And then this is the clover shape. It looks like you could have four electrons, but you can still only have two. Every single one of these is called one orientation or one orbital, okay? 
So I'm going to show you the, this last thing. So we started at spin, we did the energy level, now we did these shapes, and the last thing is the orientation. So each one of these shapes can take on different orientations, except for the sphere. So let me first show you the sphere. Here's the sphere shape, okay? And the idea is that it doesn't matter how I turn the sphere, there's only one orientation. In other words, if I had the nucleus right in the middle of this, smack dab in the middle of this, time, remember, it's like the small, you wouldn't be able to see it, right? So we had done that analogy. So the uh, nucleus is in the middle. What this is representing is not an electron moving in this direction. The electron's moving in wave-like motion, but it's got highest probability of being found inside of here. So could the electron be right here? Yeah. yeah. Yes, but the probability would be lower, okay? That's the whole idea of these clouds. So this would be like a cloud shape, and this is the sphere shape. And there's only one orientation for the sphere. So no matter what, my sphere shape only takes on one orbital or one orientation. So you can highlight or you can underline or whatever you're doing on this, or maybe just doing what I'm doing too, one orientation and one orbital. So that's the sphere shape. The next one is the dumbbell shape. And this dumbbell shape, actually has three orientations. They call it the PX, the PY, and the PZ. It's, what's that? Everybody say it. Arbitrary. arbitrary. It's arbitrary. It's going to be your new favorite word. If you'd be asked something, you'd be like, oh, that's arbitrary. <laughs> okay, so it's arbitrary. It can be X, Y, Z, which is what they assign it, but it could be Z, X, Y. It doesn't really matter, okay? So the idea, though, is that you can have two electrons anywhere in here. They don't have to be on opposite sides. They don't even have to be in here. But this is where the probability is the highest. So you have these electrons moving around, and hopefully, by his calculations, they would be somewhere within this shape, okay? So there's one shape, there's a second shape, and there's, sorry, orientation, and there's a third orientation. Same shape, three orientations. So here's the P. These are all lowercase, by the way. P is equal to three. What, three what? Three orbitals? or three orientations is what you can have for the P. Again, two electrons in each one maximum. Okay. The next shape is the D. And the D actually has five different orientations, five of them. So let me show you. And um, in this picture, this is called the DXZ, the DYZ, the DXY, the DZ squared, and the DX squared, Y squared. There are five of them. You don't have to memorize them. Okay? If you notice, they all look like that clover shape. It's just that they're going along different axes. That's all that's happening, okay, or in between. The only one that looks different is this one that they call the dx squared, okay? So this dx squared one looks a little bit different from the rest of them. In every single one of these, though, you can still only have two electrons inside of each one, okay? So let's talk pattern. In the first, s you can have one orbital, in the P you can have three, in the D you can have five orbitals or five orientations, so guess how many you can have in the F? Seven. What's the pattern? Odd numbers. Odd numbers. Everybody say one, three, five, seven. One, one three, three, five, seven. seven. Awesome. Okay. So this F has seven orbitals or seven orientations. Okay, so these are what the Fs look like, and the Fs are really complex. So there isn't one set name for the Fs, but there are seven different orientations of the F, and um, that's, again, each cloud shape, each uh, orbital here, can only have how many maximum electrons? Two. Two. Perfect. Okay. So um, this M sub L, uh, what we're going to end up talking about how he assigns the numbers, but the idea is that your um, M sub L can go from, everybody write this down, is equal to a range. And your range goes from negative L to zero to positive L. And what this is going to tell us is how many different orientations <laughs> that you can have. So for example, if we start off with the S, and if we have S, then L is equal to what number? What's sit? What number is that? Zero. Zero. So L is equal to zero. Then your M sub L can only be equal to zero because there's no negative zero and there's no positive zero. It's going to be whole numbers. It's going to go like negative three, ne negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, for example. Okay? 
So then your MCB is equal to zero, which means that I only have one orbital or one orientation there. And that was the S, that was that sphere shape that we talked about having, that the S just has one orbital or one orientation. It's arbitrary again. Let's do the next one, P. If um, it's P, then what is your number L equal to? One. So if you have to go P, you're going number one. So now your M sub L can be equal to negative one, zero, and one. positive one. Awesome. Negative one, zero, and positive one. The numbers are arbitrary. Zero doesn't mean nothing. Zero actually is one of the orientations. We can call it PX, PY, and PZ, or we can call it negative one, zero, and one. Or we could call it LMN. It doesn't really matter, okay? But they're just assigning numbers to it. So this is negative one, zero, and one. Now let's do the D. If you had to take a dump, you're going number two. two. L is equal to two. Now your M sub L, everybody do this with me. So we're gonna go from negative two to positive two. Go, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. How many orientations is that? Five. five. Those are the five orientations, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, that we talked about with the D shape having five orientations. One of them looks like this, and then the other four look like this, okay? Look like the clover shape. And the last one, F, is your flush, and what number is that? Three. Three, okay, so that's gonna be our flush. So if M sub L, if L is equal to three, then now we're gonna go do this again. Here we go, ready? Negative three, three negative two, two, negative one, zero, zero one, two, two three. three. That's seven orientations. Okay? So these are all arbitrary. There's that word, arbitrary. And it just goes from negative L to positive L. And let me just tell you two more rules before we take a break here. Um, for N, N, uh, I can stay in red actually, so this is the rule. So N basically just goes from one to seven. That's the rule for N, okay? N goes from one to seven. The rule for L is that L must be less than N. L must be less than N, and it cannot be anything, uh, it's, it goes from zero 0, 1, 2, and 3, those are your only choices. Mm -hmm. 0, 1, 2, and 3, and it has to be less than n. Okay? So those are your choices of L. Why? Because they only have four shapes. That's all that Schrodinger figured were four shapes. M sub L, we said is negative L to 0 to positive L. And the last one is M sub S. And we said that M sub S can either be equal to plus 1 half or minus 1 half. Either one. Okay, so last thing is... Um, we're going to draw the atom, do a dot for our nucleus. And then we're going to have our first energy level. And so um, may, my first energy level is going to be a little bit bigger than the rest of them. And so this is n equals 1 in its sphere shape. And so the idea is that the electron could be anywhere within here. So maybe my electron's there and my second electron is there. Remember, you don't have to have any electrons in there. But if you did, that's where the probability would be the highest, is finding it somewhere within the sphere shape. This is what I would call my 1s orbital, meaning it's in the first energy level and it's in the s shape, the sphere shape. I'm going to change colors, and doesn't matter what color I use, I'm going to go to my second energy level. So after the first energy level is filled, now I have my second energy level. So it's going to be out, it's, it's not as far out as the first energy level was, okay? So I'm going to make my second energy level. And the first thing is, I've got a sphere shape. So this I'm going to call the 2s, because it's a second energy level, but it's a sphere shape. And somewhere within here, now, I have two electrons. Maybe they're right next to each other. Maybe they're on opposite sides. Maybe they're not even in this sphere. Remember, it's all probability. So let me just draw one electron there and maybe one electron right there. It doesn't really matter where those electrons go, but somewhere within the sphere. Also in the second energy level, I can have a P shape. And so my P shape is dumbbell. So my first energy level is only sphere. My second energy level can have an S, and now it can have a P. So I'm going to do a dumbbell shape. And so coming off of the nucleus, I'm going to have a dumbbell. And this I'm going to call my 2p. Because it's going along the x-axis, I'm going to call it the 2px. Somewhere in here, there are two electrons. So I'm just going to put one there and one there. Maybe I do them on opposite and opposite lobes now. 2px. So now I'm going to do a 2py. Same thing. Now they do overlap. Okay. My y-axis is supposed to go along there and then along there. 
this I'm calling the 2PY. And somewhere inside of here, I've got two electrons. Maybe they're both in the same lobe, maybe not. Now I've got a 2PZ. Remember, this shape has three different orientations. So this I'm going to call the 2PY. And maybe both of my electrons are in that lobe. It doesn't really matter. So, so far, we have the first energy level with the two electrons inside. Then, we have our, after that gets filled, we have our second energy level, and it's a 2S, and inside of that sphere shape, there are two maximum electrons. But in addition, we have the 2P, X, Y, and Z, each of which can hold two electrons. So now let's go to the third level. I'm going to choose any color. Let's go with this kind of grayish, bluish color on mine. Third level. It's a little bit closer. It's a little bit closer than the second level. This is my 3S. And in my 3S, I can have a sphere shape with two electrons anywhere in there. So I'm just going to do them again. They don't have to be inside there. That's just where the probability is the highest. Now I have a 3P, X, Y, and Z. So real quick, just like we drew these, we're going to draw the 3P, X, Y, and Z. This is going to get to be crazy madness in a second. Here we go. 3PX, right there. Two electrons. One there, maybe one there. 3PY, one there and one lobe there. Two electrons, maybe one in there and one in there. And 3PZ, one maybe there and one maybe outside there. But in the third energy level, not only do we have the S shape, not only do we have the P shape, after you sit and you pee, what do you do next? Dump. We also have the D shape. And the D shape is clover. Four of them are clover, but there are five different orientations. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw five different orientations really, really fast. Watch this. I'm going to pick, oh no, I'm still, I'm still on my third level, so I'm going to use the same color. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Two electrons. One, two. I'm going to do it again. One, two, three, four. Two electrons. Maybe one there, one there. One, two, three, four, going along a different axis. One there, maybe one there. That's third? Was that my third one? Yeah. Fourth one. One, two, three, four. Two electrons. And my last one looks like the donut. It's got one there and one there with the donut, so maybe one electron there and one electron there. Guess what your atom starts to look like? A sphere. So that's what your atom starts to look like. It looks like craziness, okay? So the idea is that, and now that was only three levels. There are seven levels in total. There are seven levels in total. So it gets to be really crazy, but the idea is that outside the nucleus, Schrodinger calculated where the highest probability was of locating these electrons. Okay, so that's it for um, this quantum model for now. We'll come back and do electron.